Airway management is a critical skill in anesthesia and emergency medicine, as failure to secure the airway can rapidly cause hypoxia, brain injury, or death. That's why anticipating difficulties and preparing in advance is so important as we have discussed earlier in the assessment part. In this session, we'll focus on basic airway management including patient positioning, simple airway opening maneuvers, airway adjuncts, and bag valve mask ventilation. The airway is divided into the upper and lower portions. The upper airway includes the nasal cavity, oral cavity, pharynx, and larynx. The lower airway begins at the trachea and extends to the bronchi and alveoli. Key landmarks include the tongue, epiglottis, vocal cords and cricoid cartilage. The tongue is the most common cause of airway obstruction in unconscious patients. In addition to knowing the airway structures, it is important to understand how they function during breathing and airway manipulation. The pharyngeal muscles help maintain airway patency when a patient is awake, but they relax under anesthesia or sedation, which can lead to airway collapse. The epiglottis closes during swallowing to prevent aspiration, and the tongue is normally held in position by its intrinsic and extrinsic muscles. These protective mechanisms can be compromised during airway interventions or when the patient is unconscious. When this happens, simple but effective techniques are needed to reopen the airway and keep it clear. These are known as basic airway maneuvers. The most commonly used maneuver to open the airway is the head tilt, chin lift. To perform this, the rescuer stands at the patient's head and places one hand firmly on the forehead to gently tilt the head backward. The fingers of the other hand are placed under the bony part of the mandible to lift the chin upward. This combined motion of tilting the head and lifting the chin moves the tongue away from the back of the throat, helping to clear the airway. However, this technique should not be performed if a cervical spine injury is suspected. In such cases, the jaw thrust maneuver is the preferred method. To perform this maneuver, the rescuer places their fingers behind the angles of the mandible on both sides of the face and then pushes the jaw forward. At the same time, the thumbs can be used to gently lift the chin if needed. This forward movement of the mandible lifts the tongue and epiglottis away from the back of the throat, opening the airway without moving the cervical spine. Although the head tilt, chin lift and the jaw thrust are two separate airway maneuvers, they can also be performed together in combination. This is known as the triple airway maneuver. It involves tilting the head, performing a jaw thrust, and opening the mouth. The triple airway maneuver is considered the most effective manual method of opening the airway during resuscitation, before the placement of airway adjuncts or the use of bag valve mask ventilation, provided there is no suspicion of cervical spine injury. Despite using optimal airway opening maneuvers, sometimes the airway cannot be adequately open because the tongue and soft tissues continue to obstruct the pharynx. In such cases an artificial airway adjunct is required. Two most commonly used basic adjuncts are the oropharyngeal airway and the nasopharyngeal airway. The oropharyngeal airway is a curved plastic device that sits over the tongue and extends into the pharynx. Its main function is to prevent the tongue from falling back and blocking the airway. To insert the oropharyngeal airway, first hold it upside down with the tip pointing toward the roof of the mouth. Gently advance the tip until it reaches the soft palate. This positioning prevents the tongue from falling back and blocking the airway. Then rotate the airway 180 degrees so it follows the natural curve of the tongue. Finally, push the airway in until the flange or the flat part at the opening rests snugly against the patient's lips. Choosing the correct size is important, and the appropriate airway is one that extends from the corner of the mouth to the angle of the mandible. It should only be used in unconscious patients without a gag reflex, because insertion in a patient who is awake or semi-conscious can trigger gagging, vomiting, or laryngospasm. Unlike the oropharyngeal airway, a nasopharyngeal airway is better tolerated in patients who are semi-conscious or have an intact gag reflex. 
It is especially useful when mouth opening is limited, or facial trauma prevents the use of an oropharyngeal airway. To insert, gently advance the airway into the chosen nostril with the bevel facing the septum, following the natural curve of the nasal passage. A gentle twisting motion may help if resistance is encountered. If insertion is difficult, do not force the tube, instead, rotate slightly or try the other nostril. The airway is correctly positioned when the flange rests against the nostril and the tip sits in the nasopharynx above the epiglottis without obstructing airflow. The correct size is chosen by measuring from the tip of the nose to the tragus of the ear. However, nasopharyngeal airways should be avoided in cases of suspected basilar skull fracture because of the risk of intracranial placement. We will now move on to bag mask ventilation, which is the most important step to ensure that the patient is both ventilated and oxygenated. This technique is the backbone of basic airway management, and when done well, can stabilize most patients while more definitive measures are prepared. Effective bag mask ventilation depends on optimal positioning to keep the airway open, and on maintaining a reliable mask seal. Let's begin with positioning. The most effective position in most adults is the sniffing position, provided there is no concern for cervical spine injury. This involves flexing the neck on the torso and extending the head at the atlanto-occipital joint, usually with the help of a pillow or folded towel placed under the occiput. When done correctly, the external auditory meatus should align with the sternal notch. The sniffing position helps align the oral, pharyngeal and laryngeal axes making the airway more open. This is why it not only improves the effectiveness of bag mask ventilation but is also considered the standard position for direct laryngoscopy during intubation. However, some patient groups need modifications. In obese patients, a ramped position is preferred, where the head and upper torso are elevated together so that the ear canal and sternal notch are brought into the same plane. You can appreciate this positioning by comparing it to the picture on the left. In infants, the large occiput naturally flexes the neck, so a pillow is usually not required. In fact, placing a small rolled towel under the shoulders is often more helpful, as it prevents excessive flexion caused by the prominent back of the head. The infant's head should not be fully extended like an adult, instead, it should be tilted back only slightly, as if gently sniffing the air. For older children, the prominence of the occiput decreases, so a headrest or slight ramping under the head may be sufficient to achieve the sniffing position. Unlike neonates, head extension is often required for positioning. Across all age groups, the universal principle remains the same. The goal is to align the external auditory meatus with the suprasternal notch and to bring the glabella, chin plane close to horizontal. So, the use of a shoulder roll, headrest, or ramping all depends on achieving the airway alignment we have discussed, irrespective of the patient's age. As you can see in the pictures given here, the infant is positioned with head rest along with the shoulder roll to achieve the sniffing position. If a cervical spine injury is suspected, the sniffing position should not be attempted. Instead, the head must be kept in a neutral position, and a continuous jaw thrust should be applied to lift the tongue away from the posterior pharynx. If airflow remains obstructed despite this, an oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal airway can be inserted promptly to keep the passage clear before and during mask ventilation. The next important step in bag and mask ventilation is achieving the tight seal. For this, the first step is to ensure that we select the correct mask size. The mask should extend from the bridge of the nose to the cleft of the chin, covering both the nose and mouth without pressing on the eyes. A mask that is too large may leak around the chin or compress the eyes, while one that is too small may not fully enclose the airway. Once the appropriate mask is chosen, the key is to create a snug fit between the mask rim and the contours of the face. The most commonly taught method for holding the mask is the C-E technique which can be performed with one hat or using both the hands. In one-handed approach, 
The thumb and index finger form a C shape around the top and sides of the mask, pressing it gently onto the face, while the remaining three fingers form an E under the mandible to provide the jaw thrust. However, in situations where leaks persist or when one-hand ventilation is insufficient, the two-hand mask holding technique becomes necessary. In this method, both hands form the CE grip on either side of the mask, while an assistant squeezes the bag. This approach provides a stronger and more reliable seal, especially in obese, edentulous, or bearded patients where achieving an airtight fit can otherwise be difficult. In adults, certain situations make achieving a seal more difficult. In edentulous patients, the absence of teeth leads to collapsed lips and cheeks, producing leaks. Leaving dentures in place when possible or packing the cheeks with gauze restores contour and improves the seal. In obese patients or those with redundant soft tissues, extra jaw thrust and the two-hand technique are usually required. Beards may also interfere with the seal, which can be improved by applying water-soluble gel to the mask rim or shaving the area when feasible. That's all for this video. In our next video we will learn about advanced airway management.